Welcome to the players. This is episode 84 of the Weekly Wave. My guest this week is the Cincinnati Open Format DJ of the Year, Mr. DJ Ace Deuce Aaron Day, everybody. So please tune in. We got a lot to chat about. Bada bing. DJ Ace Deuce, will you send me the audio so I can start this with that? Like your, your callback that you keep on your board? Yeah. Fly as hell. Congrats, bro. The <laughs> Cincinnati DJ Open Format Champion of the Year. Is that too wordy of how you say How does it actually say on the plaque? Um, It says... Do you have an audio? I thought you were about to pull it yeah. out your pocket. <laughs> pull out the Is plaque actually... like right here. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you can either say Open Format DJ of the Year or okay. Best Open Format DJ. I mean, it says... Technically says on the plaque, best open format DJ, but that's a pretty kick ass category to have on the on the the uh what, what would you even call that? You don't give out um Fuck, what's it called, man? Oh your resume. Jeez, yeah. that took me a long time. My resume or my EPK my Yeah, EP time. okay. Better way to do it. <laughs> man, so how was the night? Did you play a set that night? I did, I did. Was it um, bumping? Yeah, it was bumping, it was bumping. Um Got into a little bit of the things that made me an open format DJ. You know, some little pop here, some, you know, take it out to the islands a little bit. <laughs> you know, play some Bad Bunny for everybody who wants, who has their phones up. Play Bad Bunny. I want to hear Bad Bunny. Yeah, what monsters? What monsters? <laughs> like, I already played Bad Bunny. <laughs> How do you feel about taking requests during your set? Is it kind of uh, interfering with... Uh, with what you're trying to curate or it depends so i'm actually i would say one of the djs who is pretty um pretty chill with the requests um a lot of times i actually look at it for two reasons i like it um for two different reasons one i can get a feel of like what the crowd wants in a way so mm -hmm. sometimes i can i can get a request for oh can you play some of this and i might not even play that but i'm like okay i can see where the crowd's mind is going. Mm -hmm. let me go this way and then also sometimes i look at it as a as a challenge like if they request something really off the wall like i'm playing i don't know i'm playing yin yang twins and they say hey can you play some abba and i'm like okay i'm gonna make it work how do you how do you go into like a thought process of like how I'm gonna mash these songs when you're also standing in the booth and things are cranked? Okay, like it's loud as hell. You can't imagine what's going on. So do you start to trial and error in the um, headphones? I mean, you can cue things up so yeah, you can hear a trial and error to really hear how it's gonna sound once you release it to the masses. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's like you thinking ahead. Um, a lot of stuff is like with me is a practice and me. A lot of the times I'm doing things on the fly, to be honest. Yeah. So, like, a lot of times, like, I'll do tricks and other things, and I'm like, how did you do that? I'm like, I thought of that maybe 10 seconds before I did it. Yeah. And I just realized, I'm like, okay, this is at this tempo and this tempo, and how am I going to make this work? And I was like, I'm going to make it work if not. If it doesn't sound all that great, then I might work out of it. So, it's some of it is trial and error, but then a lot of things is, like, I don't want to keep myself too constrained where I'm just like, oh, I shouldn't try to. Oh, and I'm like, no, if I have an idea and I really like think of the idea, like if it's going like, how is it going to work? How am I going to make it work? And I know I know my plan on how I'm going to make it work. Then go for it, especially if, especially if it's something that is is going to sort of like keep, catch people off the wall. But they're going to be like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. like if you have it in there, I did an idea I'm like. The tempo of this song and the instrumental of this song, this, they go together. They, how do I want to make it go together? Yeah. Now, when when you say like, it, it's one thing to say like they go together metrically or mm -hmm. they're in the same key. Mm -hmm. But when you're listening to like the attitude or the feel of a song, and you say they go together. Do you feel like that's like, like a, a creative merger, or are you just trying to do the math and make them line up? No, it's sort of like it's. A little bit of both. So it is, you have to make them line up because you don't want to be out of key because then that, or even off, like off key because it's going to sound terrible. Mm -hmm. So you, you're you going to have to have the skills to make things work. Make sure they're in the same BPM. Make sure you drop it on the one. Like make sure you're like one isn't way louder, louder than the other so it drowns it out. Like you have to make sure like everything lines up for it to be a good mashup if you're doing a mashup mm -hmm. but then at the same time 
it does have to be something where it's like it can be uh um it can be something like it's an odd couple like an unlikely merger Mm -hmm. but if you a lot of times it's like if you know if you know like certain type of if you know a certain type of song even if it's um like a odd couple type of thing it can work to your favor just because of the fact that people will look at you like Oh, he's trying to do this. He's trying to do this and he's making it work. Yeah. Like he's making these two things work. And then they're just and then they're just like grooving to it because the, you're ma- you're sort of making two different you it can be two different drivers or two different artists who have no business being in the same building. Yeah. Be in the same building. Well, it's, I think it's really um you know, as a musician watching a DJ, I have I have certain criticisms that either aren't valid or or don't really pertain to the genre like like one thing i love about going to see combat in particular is sometimes he plays with things that are they're in in the key and some of the things are outside of the key in a way that like he's intentionally doing mm-hmm. you know like he's stretching over certain parts but it's like it fits just enough for me to be really into it you mm-hmm. know but it still it still grinds and still pushes and then you have these moments as well where it's like <clears throat> I'm going to take this listener's expectations and I'm going to lean them left knowing that we're going right. Like, like there's that great TikTok of the guy who's about to like really throw down at a wedding for turn down for what? Mm-hmm. And then the drop hits and they go straight to Dancing Queen. Mm-hmm. And like this guy has the biggest look of disappointment on his face. But like everyone knows this moment where a DJ pulls the rug out from under you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's got to be like the most fun moment where... You take ninety percent of them there, and then you see ten people who just got their heart broke. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it it is. It's, it's sort of part of the in, the entertainment aspect of it. So speaking to that, I I dropped a. It was about a. It might have been about a year ago today, or a year and a half ago today. It was around Christmas time, so it was about a year ago today. I dropped it on my Instagram, where I did Mariah Carey. All I want for Christmas is, and people are waiting for it, and I dropped Soldier Boy for you, oh. and then everybody went crazy. <laughs> I just walked off because I knew I knew exactly when I'm going to drop that. That's going to go so far left. It's going to like blow people's mind. It's it's almost telling. It's almost like in a way like you having that joke that you ran that you ran by your friends and everybody you know how to tell it yeah and you know that it's going to hit every time it's the punchline you Mm -hmm. know that's a great way of putting that now when when you loop on a moment like all i want for christmas Mm -hmm. is do you grab is and loop is it is 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 or are you just extending that note are you stretching that one audio piece so with the song a lot of and also a lot of the things as far as like wordplay and tone play and stuff is a lot of it is like like knowing how the song goes beforehand mm. so a lot of times it's like you can pull some things off but you have to know like where the song is and how the notes um how the song is sung so like with mariah carey i know that she goes ee, ee, ee. she she does a long oh, run in it okay so i have time so i'm like i just i let it be i'm like it's naturally building because she's giving a long ass run in it yeah <laughs> and it is and drop <laughs> So it's like there. I'm like I don't. You can do things where you can loop like is is is, and and you put that on like a key command, right? Like you yeah. sign a bar, so and now you're bumping that. With my equipment, I have was people are gonna be like, what is this? It's a Pioneer DJ S9. So it's it's pretty much like the industry standard at this point for a turntable. Listen, there's they have different types of S, um, like Seven Eleven now. Those mm-hmm. are even the newer ones. But in long story short, it's a mixer that also has like keypads so like a drummer so i can put uh, so i can set a key and then wherever that song uh wherever that key um that button is that push in that song it grabs that part of the song so i can always go back to that part that mm-hmm. exact part so those are cue points um, do those cue points get saved on your computer memory in uh what's the uh, in serato so serato, it, okay. so it gets saved there um and for like the older old school djs um it's akin to when you guys had the vinyl and you guys had the little colored dots and you put your colored dots on different cue points to know that okay this is the drop oh. this is this part of the song so you know when you go when you pull it out of the vinyl i know i can go to this part this yellow dot 
and that part is, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what you got to say or yeah <laughs> probably was swing. so like that, that's funny I got this so I got a uh, it's Prince's self title mm-hmm. and it must have been some guy's burner copy cause he has a drop point on the outro of I wanna be your lover mm-hmm. which like if you're a if you're a classic uh, like a hip hop DJ like if you're a true vinyl guy I can see why that outro is awesome it's four minutes of sexy, danceable, instrumental. Mm-hmm. So you can pull whatever acapellas you have, which I guess at that point in time, guys don't really have that. It'd just be an MC going over it. Yeah, and so that's actually really the basis, like, giving people history, that history lesson, that is really what hip-hop, that's where hip-hop really started. Mm-hmm. And that's what, in essence, really started hip-hop, was that you had DJs at these parties, um in the Bronx um, New Yorkers you can debate amongst yourselves they always say where hip hop started I think it's in the Bronx yeah um, go fight in the comments <laughs> but um, but basically um, they used to have um, parties in like block parties and then parties in like recreation centers and whatnot. and the DJ um, one thing they would do is they would have like two copies of the same song mm-hmm. and so they knew that they would have like say a four eight or 16 point um 16 bars where it's just that instrumental and then you can go from one part uh, you can go drop it on that par- uh, part of that instrumental mm-hmm. and then go to the other one um of the same copy drop it on that and you can go back and forth basically forever yeah if you know how to basically what's called be juggling so you can go back and forth forever and now you just basically ripped whatever song that is and made it into a long instrumental and then MCs will come up and just like direct the crowd and then that developed into okay I'm going to go up and perform and rap yeah and that's where sort of like hip hop was birthed from that's awesome I've never heard the term beat juggle before Mm -hmm. but you know I was just listening to like a similar story of Rick Rubin talking about back in the days being like a New York punk being the only kid going to these clubs because he wanted to see DJs and Mm -hmm. like like a Grandmaster Flash, like throwing down, and mm-hmm. like he was getting to be there in these moments. But then when you'd hear, um, when you'd hear the first rap records, like uh, uh, what's the God? What's the first like true rap hit? Like what you say is what I'm grooving towards the beat. Uh, rappers oh, delight, yeah, yeah, rappers delight. Yeah, so like rappers delight. When well, you like, said it on the point, I'm like, why am I blanking out on this? Yeah, exactly. I'm like like that should be the easiest <laughs> question. Yeah, rappers. <laughs> About Sugar Hill, but it, it, it's like it's very, um, it's almost a disco kind of format mm-hmm. of R and B. It's not, it's not a rap song necessarily. So when you get Rick Rubin in there, he's trying to say like, let's take things from the classic hip hop catalog, uh, and he was really talking about the inception, of like when Walk This Way mm-hmm. gets pulled back for Run DMC. He goes like, that drum break intro was already part of like the the beat juggling catalog like mm-hmm. guys would pull that all the time just because it's a great kick snap mm-hmm. k- kick snare hat beat so it's crazy to hear like there are there are classics from that category that um i would wonder when you're getting in the game of djing and you're starting to look through the classics you're trying to build your um discography do you download songs that already have cue points that the the greats have have laid out and you're adopting? Um, yes, um, absolutely. So, I mean, to this point, I would say I'm still a newer DJ because I, I mean, I came up in the mid to late 2010s with yeah. really DJing, so I'm more digital than anything. But as when I'm building my discography, I do do sort of like a history lesson, a deep dive, and see like what big songs like from the 80s and 90s like what are they sampling what are they what are they Mm. what are they what are they sort of drawing from and that's sort of like the hip-hop head in me as far as where hip-hop i would say has a unique perspective and also why there's so many different styles and why it's so big is because it can pull from anything because how it's birthed is it's birthed off of basically taking something and ad libbing and creating something better. It's almost like taking an existing song or taking an existing dish and adding your own flavor to it and making it it even greater. So mm-hmm. that's why you can hear samples from 
like a walk this way or, or like parliament what, records parliament or, or, what's, what's or the, the one, big beat or snoop has this one song that he sampled like six times and i can never remember what that parliament track is i mean but, he samples so many like parliament things i mean that whole g-funk era was basically just re, like dr dre is sort of like pulling from like the parliament and ohio players and a lot of those funk bands yeah and then sort of adding sort of like a slower like gangster twist to it that's what that's why corrupt said and um regulators i mean i said corrupt but warren g said in regulators is g funk era thugged out with a gangster twist so it's basically funk with a gang with just adding sort of like the NWA, the hardcore twist. So it's just, yeah. a lot of times it's just, you can take so many different elements of something where you can hear a song, you can hear even like a folk song and say, I like that. I can loop that and then put that in and I'm mm-hmm. going to add drums to this. And so it's like you're pulling from this and you're getting an idea and bouncing it off and then creating something that's totally different, but then you can sort of sample back. So, a lot, of, a lot of times when you're when I'm building my category, uh, I do build off of samples just so I can sh- I can play that song that people are gonna really love, but then also I can throw it back to show people, give people a little bit of history lesson, like why this song is so great and where this where that song where that where that origin of that beat or that melody or that loop came from. So yeah. I think it's really cool to think like um, so. There's this category of of sampled materials that are the classics there, and a lot of them do come from an instrumental background or just like the essence of them has to be that way for the, the classic utilization of it, mm-hmm. like a true club format. So when you're looking at that catalog versus the catalog of hits that you play in your set, it's like okay, I can now layer the hits with some of the greatest breakbeats of all time by mm-hmm. playing with tempo mapping and things like that. Absolutely. And it's so cool to hear a guy pull like pull that walk this way, you know, intro beat and lay it over like like something ridiculous like Party in the USA. Mm-hmm. But now it has this kind of eighties smash to it. Yeah. They are like, okay. Not- so it's almost like if Miley Cyrus just went back to the eighties and went a little bit of like grungy with it. And yeah. I, it's got and some I more- just, um, I might actually do a video where I actually do that. Just take it, take yeah, it. Yeah, because because once you do that, you can. I mean, you just pulling that idea. That's sort of like the essence of it, and essence of with hip hop and DJing going hand to hand, where you're just sort of having this instrument where you have an unlimited arsenal of things. Make it, make ma- make a masterpiece with it. It's like you're in a kitchen and you're you have unlimited ingredients. Yeah. So, Everybody, know, everybody knows how to make mac and cheese. Everybody knows how to bake a cake. Mm-hmm. How are you going to make that even better? What are you going to add your twist to it? Man, well, really quick, let's bust this out. I, I, Oak, Oak Eye. My mother gave me this because she went and celebrated her birthday on the bourbon, on the bourbon trail. Mm-hmm. Some of you all may not know this. Aaron and I are pretty much family, so he was partying with the family. I think I had COVID. Uh, but they brought this back, and you say you had some awful story about this day, or was this a different day? You were talking this was about? a different day. So okay. it was actually the other bottle that you have right there. <laughs> that Jack Honey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the oak is cool. Salute. Salute. Woo! That's nice. <sighs> nice. Oh yeah, but. The oak is cool. The Jack Daniels, I still give the side out a little bit just because I have a, I do have a horror story with Jack Daniels, honey. So, um, so basically in college, um, it was after homecoming. I was at Wilmington College. Oh god! And so it was after homecoming, and I was a homecoming game, and we balled out but lost. I was so mad because it. Was, what do you mean you balled out but lost? That, that ain't the true. game. I know it was. It, <laughs> I know it it, it sounds it, it doesn't make any sense, but it was like for any of my alumni, you know about that game. It was like seven three for like the entire game, and we had like three turn like three takeaways. I picked yeah, up. You're, a, on, you're on D, so you're, yeah, I'm on D. I I I had a fumble recovery. I tried to re- take back for a touchdown. Oh, it was like crazy, and we just we couldn't score so i ended up being like 14 to 3 like it was like and we were just That's like just so kidding hard. i know who, the defense no offense love the offense i love my offense i love arrow <laughs> all my women's 
um, once in a while, especially once on offense. But we're just looking like, just score. We st- we're stopping them. Just score. And they couldn't. I was like, ah. And so after that game, I was just so, like, dejected about it. <laughs> mad. And so at the time, um, at the time, I was – Oh yeah, at the time there was going to be a party afterwards, um, a little bit off campus at the Sig House. All my women said, "I'm not know about the Sig House." At the Sig House. The Sig. Sig. Oh, thank uh-huh. God. S I C K is what no, I thought no. you said. No, it, 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 yeah, you party there. Paradise. Yeah, I mean, how the house is, you can probably get sick there. You, <laughs> you actually, you, you, there's a good chance you can get sick there. That house is definitely is unsanitary. But was that the the frat that you were part of? No, I wasn't a part of any frat. But okay. um, that was like the party house. So um. And then they had a barn in the back that used to, oh, yeah, and they used to have this party called Back to Back, which I say I when I first got my DJing start, I don't count this as part of my DJing career anymore, but I used to bring in a laptop, and I used to have all the songs, so that that's when I started. It was like, I can play better music here. Yeah. Download a virtual DJ um, program and became the unofficial DJ, campus DJ and, like, DJ the biggest parts. They used to have a uh, thing called Back to Back where it was a basically a barn about the size about the size of this okay two to three hundred people in it <laughs> easily gross, and people coming from like gross different fire states. hazard oh oh my goodness like it <laughs> like if anything happened it would have been a very bad tragedy that would yeah, have been a national a newsworthy news. loss yeah. <laughs> but but bring, bring it back basically there was a party there at um that night and then i had Someone go buy me a bottle of Jack Daniels honey. The reason being is because on my dad's side of my family, a lot of um like my older uncles who do drink, they drink Jack Daniels exclusively. Yes. So I was like, I don't want to just get into straight Jack Daniels. I was young at the time. So I'm like, let me get the honey. I'm like, that sounds like it is good. And so I was just sitting on like off um off campus apartment and I was just drinking. I was just pulling I would, from the handle, pulling from the handle, oh, and I was yeah. thinking On the, about before your gig. <laughs> no, I didn't. I wasn't even a d- DJ okay, or doing okay. anything. I was there was just going to be a party there, and I was just dr- pulling from the handle. Next thing you know, I look up, the bottle's gone. I drank that entire oh. thing in forty five minutes. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so I'm like, first I'm thinking, oh, the room's, the room's been. I'm good. I'm thinking I'm all right. We get in the car and go to the party. I am sick. I'm on the. I'm like on the side of the barn, just like. Man. And then they play. I remember it vividly. They played this song called "Baby D, Watch Her Do It," and the song is major bass. It goes like boom, boom. And as soon as the bass hit me, I ran out the back and projectile vomited. Dude, what? I, a- I ended up having to go to sleep with a trash can by my I threw up when I said literally project I didn't know you could really do that you it was <laughs> fire hydrant dog. fire hydrant yeah. and I I didn't drink for probably a couple months after and every time I couldn't even look at that bottle so Dude, that was, I'm, I'm sorry I brought up the Jack Honey I blacked down the Jack Honey as well uh, probably about a year and a half ago in Louisville. Mm. I thought, like, you know, the band's been drinking a lot on these gigs. Why don't I get us a bottle of liquor beforehand so I don't have a bar tab at the end? And I didn't eat anything that day, and I drank too much That's of the Jack Honey. Up. Exactly. And we get out this gig, and I was like, okay, I got to eat something because we're driving back to Cincinnati that night. Mm. So you ever gone to Spinelli's in Louisville? No. Spinelli's is like their, like, New York style pizza. It's so good. I, I went clobber in time. I killed two slices, mm-hmm. and I immediately stood up, and I was like, this is the evacuation moment. So I yacked at Spinelli's. I get most of this up. The pizza kind of saved me. Then I fell asleep in the back seat of my car. They drove me back to Cincinnati. <laughs> Someone else had to switch to driving, take me home, and then take her car back. So God bless good friends for driving. But man, Jack Honey might be a murderous liquor. It is, because it, it's good. It tastes good. Yes, the but, sweetness. Yes, the sweetness, and you don't notice it until you drink too much. And once you drink too much, it's no going back, because it's <laughs> still a whiskey. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'm drinking, drinking. Oh, you went past the point of no return, and there is no saving you. Yes. Now, do you like drinking on your sets, or do you normally reserve nights of heavy drinking for your off nights? I'm at the age where I don't drink heavy 
anyway <laughs> anymore. Yeah. But um, no, that was one of the first things I really learned. Like, um, being a D- and being a DJ is like you have to still look at it as your job. Like one of my OG DJs told me, he said like there are plenty of pitfalls in this industry, and like he said, I've seen so many DJs met talented DJs mess up by just getting blackout drunk at the bar you think and mm-hmm. you're thinking oh I can DJ better drunk and it's like most of the time no you can't you probably sound like crap that doesn't say I don't drink I do I'll have some drinks and everything but it's all about really maintaining like your 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 level like yeah maybe a drink or two but then once you get into like okay three four or five drinks and then you're looking up and then everything's feeling warm and fuzzy and it's midnight it's like okay stop because yeah. you don't want to be blackout drunk and then you're just like doing whatever and then you're thinking that you're okay but you're really not like you have to really with djing you still have to maintain your composure and think of it as like you wouldn't drink on the job mm-hmm. would you you wouldn't go you wouldn't go into your shift, say, "Hey, I'm gonna take a shot or two or three or four or five and do my job." Like, no. Then why would you go into DJing, do, doing that? You still gotta maintain a level of professionalism with it. It's like it's not to say like, okay, you can have a drink and have fun, but you still gotta remember, you you gotta maintain your brand. Yeah. It, it's especially, you know, I think just having a microphone in hand when you're doing that too, it's like you're exposing yourself to a certain amount of liability and risk. And like the thing that I probably learned the hardest from, like, I don't, I don't think there's many gigs in my life where I've been too drunk to the point where I'd be ashamed of someone seeing my performance. But we, we've all been ashamed of our performance because of liquor in one way or another. It's just like, it's an honesty to have with yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's something about like when a homie walks in the room and you know in that moment, like, they're they're you know sober as sober as they're gonna be, and and they're not vibing with it because I'm not putting on my best show. Like, that's a call to action mm-hmm. that we all gotta feel, and our friends gotta tell us about. Like, and good friends do bring that shit up. Like, hey, you weren't on it, you know, you didn't sound great, and and we gotta be grateful people that that yeah. do tell us that kind of thing. But absolutely, here here's a misconception that I I have about DJs, and I think having more DJ friends in my life such as yourself, such as combat that like I've actually jammed with, has given me a way wider respect for guys that, that can improvise, the guys that make it jazz in that moment where they, they play the night, they play their feelings, they play the mood of the room, they play the requests while also doing their thing. Is there a panic switch in your system where it's like, I need to step out for an hour of my set, shit's going down. Can you hit play and it's going to run your set as if you were there? Or is nothing predisposed, nothing pre-aligned? I mean, there are things you can do with Serato, say, if, like, shit hits the fan. Yeah. Um, so there's, Say your car's getting towed. And yeah, you gotta something like, yeah, you got to. So one thing for DJs to have is to have a couple pre-recorded sets, maybe in different BPMs mm. um, for different type of genres of nights where you can... Okay, yeah, like you said, your car's getting towed. You got to handle that because if you, your car's getting towed, how the hell are you going to get home? <laughs> yeah, you ain't leaving the gig then, dude. Exactly. So you have something where you can, oh, I'm in this BPM. I can mix into this, and I got like an hour of this just playing, and I can go handle that. Or or you just fade into it. Or, um, mm-hmm. I mean, they have what well, we have, like, bathroom um bathroom sets yeah where it's just like maybe 10 15 minutes if you gotta you know evacuate the bowels yes or things like that nature what you using the term evacuate the bowels is a pretty serious context like it's pretty casual everyone hits the bathroom but you're like things are serious i need 30 to 45 minutes yeah that's it that's if like okay i (laughs) eat something and i'm like i really shouldn't have eaten that yeah and also to find a clean bathroom somewhere on this block right now (laughs) Tip for DJs, what I learned, find a hotel. Hotel bathrooms in their lobby are the cleanest bathrooms you'll ever find. Are you talking about the AC? Is that what you're telling me? You, it's word. I mean, they do. The AC, I mean. Yeah. It's better than tin roof. It's mm-hmm. better. It's better. Ba- yeah, I'm yeah. like, don't. DJs, don't. Don't be that person who sh- who shits at the club. Yeah. Don't be. <laughs> 
Sorry, my life. But don't uh, be that person. That's, that's so just, funny. Ugh. Man. So, Unless it's Rebel. I will say, Rebel has the best bathrooms. And Rebel also has a clean aesthetic. It's not mm-hmm. like... You know, I, I feel bad for my bartender friends who, like, I see their club get torn up Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and then Monday someone's got to work that shift and act like everything's okay when they got to mm-hmm. use the commode. It's like, that's not kosher. We should all be a little bit more respectful of the facilities, the places Absolutely. we frequent. Absolutely. If you're not going to do it in, if you're not going to do that at your house, don't do that at the bar. You mean projectile vomit with my pants down? Why would I not do that? <laughs> <laughs> That's that's the mo at some of these places, man. I'm like, wow, there's some. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some horror stories. I'm like, who, who raised you, dude? One of the first times I played the Lexington Tin Roof, I walked in the men's restroom. And I swear to God, there's standing water, like an inch of standing water, and I'm like, wow, this is pretty graphic. So I'm step up to the urinal, I'm doing my thing, and a beer bottle comes floating downstream in this standing <laughs> water. Like there's there's a current. Because there's so much liquid. And I was like, if this is how it is next time, I can't come back. They did fix it that time. Mm-hmm. It, honestly, I have a lot of tin roof stories about overflowing. I understand. Bathrooms. Like, I love tin roof. And I love and it. Can, has, it has a dive. I get it because it has a, the, the whole thing about tin roof, it, it is a dive aesthetic. Yes. So you're going to get some things. It's not supposed to be the most preppy and like buttoned up place that's not mm-hmm. the aesthetic it's supposed to be the thing where you feel like at home like your neighborhood dive bar so i get it yeah but then at the same time and this isn't an indictment on tin roof some t- i think it's an indictment on some people who just like come into tin roof and they're just like oh yeah it's sort of like a dive bar i can treat it like a dive bar yeah it's like dude still aim yeah <laughs> like you don't need to be peeing on the floor you're that drunk that you're just missing everything and peeing on the floor. You need to go home. It's that that's the sign. Your night's over. Yeah. Go home, sleep it off. Go get a PB and J sandwich. <laughs> sleep it off. You're so right though. Where it's like people, people take ownership of their local dives in like in the inverse way of owning something. It's like, oh, this is my utility to to shit on. Literally, it's like it's it's saying to throw. And they also they treat the staff and the bands like that sometimes, and the DJs as well. Like. You know, it's it's hard in moments where, especially if you're keeping it together, especially if you're the sober guy entertaining this bar of drunks, mm-hmm. to feel uh to feel disrespected by the audience is a really hard thing to to overcome. Absolutely. And what what would you say built up your callous towards an audience and their reactions? Some of that, I mean, it's always a learning process because you're getting thrown curveballs constantly. And you figure out a way. I mean, that's also a testament to not drinking too much because you don't want to be give them that same energy. Mm-hmm. Because it might feel good in that moment, but then you might regret it. And then you might go overboard where the staff feels a way about you going nuclear on somebody. <laughs> so it's like, and I'm, this is an testament not to drink. I'm like, I, if you're out, we definitely get um, DJ and we definitely can have a shot and everything. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm definitely about. Okay, we have a shot. It's just also knowing that level, knowing that line. It's like, okay, I'm good. Yeah. And still maintaining the professionalism. But that's that's where sort of like to piggyback off that, like maintaining your professionalism and knowing it's like when I'm out, I look at it as like, okay, this is this is what I love to do, but I'm also, I'm a business. Mm-hmm. So I look at it as like, I'm a business. This is part of the brands. Like don't want my brand to be someone who's just like going off on people and, and fighting people and jumping out. <laughs> like, there's been plenty of times where it's like, they've been disrespectful and I wanted to jump off stage. Yeah. Jump out the booth and kiss some ass. There was one time I wanted not to <laughs> name names. There was one time I wanted to jump off stage and drag somebody by their dress. All across the bar. Oh, we, we just we just isolated the categories. Just strictly <laughs> yeah. Aaron fighting dreadheads. That's People at Millions know exactly what incident this was. I was about to... That's when I was livid. But then at the same time, you have to know that it's like... You're only going to hurt yourself more by giving them the same measure. You always have the ability, like, if somebody's just being mad, disrespectful, and mad, and, like impeding your performance you can always call security tell them hey they've been drinking so much they got to get away you can yeah. always tell them this, like because you you're also knowing you also have to know that you at that point are sort of an extension of the bar so yeah security is going to have your back if you if, have to make that judgment call like this is a problem 
tell them to get away or to tell them they have to leave. Yeah. Um, and it's a great testament yeah. too to why to be friends with the security in a place like absolutely. Not only are those like some of the toughest guys in the room, but but sincerely, they probably have to go through the most. And like at at all the tin roofs that I've played, like those are the first people that I befriend. Mm-hmm. You know, because because one, they're they're very hospitable people. They they deal with the newcomers. They're they're probably the most directly involved with the consumer bases of anybody there. But also in, in moments of, of difficulty, like uh, a security personnel that knows how to de-escalate mm-hmm. and get someone out your face and get them out the club in a way that's you know, not abrasive to the room is a really special thing. And that those guys a, don't get paid enough to do I that love sometimes. I you said that. Like, my uncle was a security guard for a long time, worked at, um, worked at one of the hardest clubs to work at um, back in the day, the Ritz. And that was one of the things when he was telling me, like, coming up, that um, that was, like, one of the things that separates you, like, as far as, like, security guard from just, like, a bully who's just, who has a black shirt that says security. Just, like, a true professional security guard versus just someone who's just going to rough house people. Like, the ones who are really good is the people who can de-escalate without ever having to get physical, who know how to talk to that person who's at 10, bring them back to a four. Yeah. Knows how to just make the night, just like knows how to talk people down and knows how to resolve conflict without ever having to throw a punch. Or- yeah, because for the people in the room, like you know, there's been a couple of times where like a fight truly breaks out. Like not only are people throwing hands, but people are catching hands who aren't involved in this shit because mm-hmm. these drunks don't know... You know, people are just swinging, and then it turns into a brawl, and you're like, okay, so wow, now now the entire audience is fighting each other, the staff is closing in, I'm in the middle of a guitar solo, you're in the middle of scratch and something, it's like, do I kill the music and the vibe, and we turn our attention to this, or do we finish this situation cleanly enough that we can act like it didn't happen and proceed as, as needed? Tin Roof Indianapolis. Dude, Tin Roof Indianapolis. Were you there the night that we had that that oh, yeah. brawl? I think you were you uh were you I think you already left the stage. So I was I was playing solo at that time. Okay. So, okay, this is another incident um example of that. So like you we were playing and it was like I was closing out the night for like twenty more minutes and all of a sudden I looked to the left and there was a brawl. Dude. It was like two people fighting and the security had to come in and carry them out yeah. through the side door. And those guys are great. Tinder Fendi is great yeah. security. But when two guys honestly start scrapping and it's like we're just gonna move this pile of people out here. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and as and as a DJ, you have to also take note of that as like, okay, don't just go like don't just act like it's business as usual and keep playing music. No, because like you have to stop. You have to sort of like get people's attention to this so they don't like get into the scrum. Mm-hmm. And then also like you have to sort of de-escalate sort of like the energy in the room because that can sort of even if they're over there, if there's other tension in the room, just them seeing that can have somebody who's like. I've been wanting to punch this other person over here all yes, night. And yes. then that turns into multiple fights and turns into a brawl. So there's so many great movie scenes exactly. of that where it's like, I've been waiting all night for a fight to break out. Exactly. Like, and and then it, that's when you have one of those things where it's just like, <laughs> and, like and a lot of times where DJ, a lot of times DJs end up getting complained. Oh, they're playing so many rowdy music. They're playing so much hip hop. And it's like, that has nothing to do with it. It's just that person wanted to punch that other person. He's yeah. drunk all night. He just wanted a re he just needed a reason. So, to speak to that, Tim Ruffini, so, like, I remember I cut the music, and then I play Why Can't We Be Friends. Yes, yes, yes. So, with that, that de-escalates the situation. It's a comical moment, part of the entertainment of it. So, a lot of times when I do things, I'm like, it's part of the entertainment of just, like, okay, how people laugh off. And then how people are like, why can't we be friends? Yeah, people so, still swinging, getting so, pushed out the door exactly. while people swaying in the background. And so, <laughs> like, that entire – and you, if somebody walks in on that and seeing people just sw- – so that- why can't we be friends to a fight? They see the absurdity of it. And it's like – even the people who are fighting, like, why were we doing that? Yeah. Was that Thanksgiving Eve last year? That might have been. Okay, that's that seems right. I yeah. think that's where we played. Man, you know, I 
and you know this is this is a knock on any brand, but you know when when I get allotted four hours of time in my set and I'm playing the late night crowd, it's occurred to me many times that to keep the energy up, asking a band to run you know marathon distance four hours you know into the night turns into uh you know diminishing results for what you're paying for. Mm-hmm. So I had the impression of. Instead of bringing another guitar player or a keyboard player, why not bring in you and we can jam, hand it off. You turn that shit up to nine. We come back. We do our thing. And like, there's this nice play on that kind of thing that I think we're still, as much as the world's used to bands that have DJs, people aren't used to cross medium shows in these clubs. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, that's, that's the. That's the emergence of, of, of greatness when you have guys like yourself who contextualize the music in a totally different way than we do, but then we bring it together and it's like, oh, this is what this is what radio couldn't do for me. This is what a stale show couldn't do for me. This is exactly. this is live music. Mm-hmm. I think I think people will catch on down the road, but I think a lot of people are resistant to change, and that's not a knock to any like people who attend club or bars or any like bar staff or bar management a lot of times like I think people really have a problem like understanding things that they might not directly be involved in and like oversimplify things so a lot of times they like oversimplify of a band they think oh yeah you guys can go up there and sing four hours sing your heart out four hours and and it's like it's not the same as like a DJ playing four hours. We can play four hours. We could play marathon sets because we're not actually using our vocal cords for four hours. Mm-hmm. We're DJing and doing everything. We're controlling the crowd, but actually getting up there and singing and playing guitar and everything. Yes, you you can see maybe some other. You can see major bands play two three hour sets, but you always see them have intermissions. You always mm-hmm. see them change clothes. You're not seeing them just play song after song after song after song after song. Yeah, exactly. There's that you're gonna. Nobody has energy and vocals for that. They're gonna die out. Yeah. Well, and there's people that do, and like it's something to train for. But I think we also like audiences now have a different attention span than in the '70s, where you went to see a three-hour rock show and you were entertained even during the intermission just because you were at the rock show and that was enough. Now it's like, why haven't you jumped to another hit? You know, like these guys have been playing, you know, this Lenny Kravitz song for four minutes, which is the actual length of the song. But I'm bored because if I saw a DJ pull this Lenny Kravitz in, I get two hooks and we're out. Exactly. And in that kind of that kind of positive competition, you know, that that egging on of of where could we go is something that you can't get without um, you can't get as a band without adopting to what's going on with DJs to say like, you know, w- when we were talking about my set in particular, you gave some nice advice of like, I hear your song with this Lenny Kravitz song. I hear this with that. And we're talking about medleys that are maybe something clear as day to someone in your game that to me, it's like, no, these are two four minute songs. And you're like, no, these are two, two minute songs. One four minute song. It's like, mm-hmm. Oh, I see what you're you're yeah. pushing at here. A lot of times it's just like melding that thing and just like pulling things out that people haven't seen mm-hmm. because like you said, people's attention span is like that. It's like a fly. Like we're we're stuck to we're attached to the hip to this and cat videos and all <laughs> and cat so. videos. You just told them your full truth, man. Like I'm looking at kitties on the internet, exactly. man. <laughs> Kitties and boxers and all and all sorts of crazy stuff. So you box your parents, you crazy. <laughs> but yeah, but the thing is, is that people's attention span is so short that a lot of times you do have to do things that just sort of like catch them by surprise. Like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's going to this. Oh, okay. Because it's like that's why you see people's song. Well, besides streaming, a lot of times people's songs are getting shorter because people aren't really, unless you're really doing something outside the box as far as your song, people are sort of like the energy sort of dying by the third verse because Mm -hmm. people are like, okay, I feel that for the second song. What are you going to do next? What's next? What's next? What's next? We're getting fed so much information and everything 
that we're sifting through more in a day than previously we got in a week. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, a lot of times we have to hit people with things over the head and move and move and move and move. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you can't return to things Mm -hmm. like, you know, that's the brilliant thing about you being in on one of our sets. You catch us by surprise. Like, like there was something really fun when we were doing like uh, Funkadelic and you have an acapella over there and I forget mm-hmm. that you're about to pull this on me. But now the interest has changed and we get this digital slant to what's going on and that kind of um, lift and curiosity is how the mind works. Like mm-hmm. I'm not demanding you give me another song, but I am demanding you give me something different. Than what I just already heard. Yeah, exactly. If somebody's at the car like here in Operation Funkadelic. Mm-hmm. But then they go see your show and hear Operation, Operation Funkadelic. They love that. But now if they're like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing this at the in the car, Operation Funkadelic. And then we're getting a different version of Operation Funkadelic broken down. It's like, oh, this is a different treat for me coming to this show. I'm getting yeah. something different that I can't get anywhere else. Yes. That's, that's the thing of the, the evolution. But then also it's, it's sort of the things that the nuances that – people have brought in live shows and bits and pieces all along. It's just that sometimes people haven't looked at it. So like my, my first real concert I ever went to was the week, um, was the weekend. Really? Yeah, I know. Uh, I've, that seems so out for your taste. You know what I mean? Like not that I wouldn't assume you like the weekend, but you're such an avid music lover. I would have seen you as an eight year old going to a show or something like that. So growing up, like, we didn't go to, I didn't go to concerts or anything like that. It wasn't that like my parents didn't, uh, uh, didn't love music. I mean, and it wasn't like we were like dirt pro or anything, but it's like I came from like middle class. So it's like the treats and other things in life was like, okay, go on a vacation and go to pro football hall of fame or going out to eat or something like that. So like, as far as like a concert, my parents like music, but I was the one that sort of like gravitated towards it from a creative standpoint. Mm. So as far as like my like going to concerts and other things like that, that didn't really like occur in my mind. Like of of being like an even an uh, interesting type of thing until later, because I previously thought before I went to my first concert, I was like, why are people going to concert to hear like a poor version of the song I can just play in my car and it's the finished version. I'm like, I'm not going to pay all this money to hear that. Yeah. But then actually when I went and saw how Weekend broke it down, he went into like a medley of like nine of his hits and they all went together perfectly. I was like, oh, that's different. Yeah. But, but what, what a great what a great realization for a lot of us. Like if you're not a kid growing up playing, you forget the – that there's like this, um, there's a separation between what you get in real life and what you get online. Mm-hmm. And online, you get this polished, clean version of that, and you don't imagine there could be anything better than that. And like, like Bruno Mars is one of the best examples where stuff is so cleanly produced. But if you want to go watch musicians be musicians, go to his live show because these dudes throw down. And maybe it's not, it's not the the timeless version. It's the over the top. You know, nine song medley where they throw in a cover of Billie Jean or something crazy mm-hmm. like that, and and you got to be ready for that kind of mind blowing experience. It is. It's where you actually like feel that energy of that person, and you see like, oh wow, they're breaking it out into this, and then they're, exactly he's going into Billie Jean, and then he's going into, I don't know, he might go into something from the nineties, mm-hmm. or he might really like break down into like a really cool ballad for something or he might just go out of the blue and bring anderson pack in there Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you you didn't even know anderson pack was on the bill for this one (laughs) bro seeing anderson pack pop up at the super bowl like i okay i was fucked up during the super bowl me and em went to Asheville. Mm -hmm. we were partying with some friends like no one in here wants that cares about the Bengals. we're in north carolina so we're losing it we're so excited the halftime show and like this bar empties out and I am glued to the TV because I'm so excited to see Snoop and Dre. 
And then, like, you see, like, 50 Cent come up hanging upside down. Mm-hmm. Not looking great for 50. No. But <laughs> he's, looking, he's looking about 60, 70, 70 cents, bro. Bro, something about the way cent. he dropped out was, like, very, like, TMNT. I was like, Donatello? Like, what are you doing, Vinny? Like, <laughs> he did. like, this ain't right. He looked like he was holding his breath while he's like, I can't <laughs> do this much longer. How, how long do you think he was upside down with the blood just rushing to his head? About like, 20, shit, man. <laughs> another 30 seconds, he would have dropped the mic. He's just been saying. <laughs> But, you know, Anderson comes out and, like, he's just a supportive role in that and, like, plays it so well. It was so cool, man. I I just thought of this question. I don't want to lose it. Is scratching the most um, expressive part of your set or is it just kind of a medium for expression? I think it's one part, medium of expression. I'm going to say it's the most expressive part of my set because I look at myself as just – so much than just like a turntable scratcher. I mean, there's for some DJs that is their most expressive part because they're excellent scratchers. I would consider myself, oh, okay, pretty good scratch. Okay, to pretty good scratcher at this point. I know some DJs who are insane scratchers, and mm-hmm. that and they basically use <clears throat> their scratches like jazz instruments like they can do all sorts of things that yeah it's like combat, a combat combat for one yeah he is insane with it dude combat's the kind of guy that has injured himself scratching so hard you know what oh, i mean absolutely. like like put himself in a place where it's like physically the body does not want to go there and mm-hmm. his mind is so willing to do it tobot is another one of those yeah. guys too where it's like toby's a drummer by trade so the way he plays that is like a drum solo and seeing how cats play that game, like I, I appreciate your modesty, but I think anyone that can go in there and say, how many ways can I subdivide mm-hmm. what's going on here? And then the actual facility of up, down, left to right, how I get the, the squeak and the squawk of that. It's such yeah. a crazy instrument. It's just different. Te- it's just like learning those different techniques and then mastering it and then just like putting the com- combinations together. And I'm really like, that's what that's where you sort of get the jazz to is like what am i going to do here here and then here 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 to sort of like express and do something different and then but i would say that as far as like the uh, for me as a dj my expression is the where i go left and do a lot of masters or do like wordplay where i do things that people really don't expect or think or are it's left field and make things go together that don't because with that it's just me being espresso just saying hey you gave me i have all these like go back to bacon i have all these different ingredients and i'm over here trying to make the best cake i can uh can't on the fly so it's just me just getting ideas processing okay how am i going to do this oh i'm gonna do this 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 and then throw cross into the wind and then like really doing it it's like hey here's this idea that i thought like a lot of times people say like his people say sometimes like oh, i have like this weird face while i'm djing where i'm just like this is <laughs> because i'm literally getting an idea where it's like i heard this word and i'm like oh that's a i'm like those four words Nicki Minaj said that in this song oh. eight years ago. Let me loop this and then bring it up. And then now I go to the Nicki Minaj song and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. I remember one of my, this one thing that I did. Yeah. Oh, this is one thing that I did. Um, and I did this on the fly. It was back when the scene was open. Now it's Azul. Um, I was. Um, oh, absolutely. I don't have anything to do tonight. <laughs> But it was back when Scene was open downtown. And so, like, I was playing with DJ Agron, I think, at the time. So, like, I was playing, and then um, it was back when Mo Bamba was popping. And then, um, I know, the begin the expletive far away breaks it down. Like, uh-oh, fuck, shit, bitch. And then, so, like, everybody was growing up, but then I just got an idea, the bitch. And so, I was like, use the key point, like, um, loaded up on the the second part of my um, loaded up on the other side of mine, made it a key point, a uh, key point, and then went and then so at the end of like when everything's hyped, I go, uh oh, fuck, shit, 
bitch, and I'll loop it like bitch, 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 and speed it up, and then I go into Machine Gun Kelly, uh, Wild Boy, bitch, bitch, yeah, bitch, yeah, bitch, I was, and everybody in the whole place like lost. The whole roof was about to cave in that. Like, what the fuck? That's crazy. I'm like, and I'm, and then it's jumping. I'm like, yeah, bitch, yeah, bitch. They're like, what the fuck? Did you? I'm like, I literally thought that up 13 seconds ago. So walk me through that on your cues, because like, that I've had so much fun just watching over your shoulder, watching over combat shoulders, because it's, it's, it's like logic. It's mm-hmm. like Pro Tools. Like, so when you're trying to re-engage these back and forth, and you're using your left to right fader. Mm-hmm. Do you switch Q, switch Q, switch Q? So with How that, it's like home? so like a lot of times with Serato is when I have it on one Q, I can do what's called doubling. I can hit two buttons and make that same song go over to here at the same time. So like I can do that if I want to, if I think of something like, oh, I need to bring that song back over here so I can put something on that song without me stopping the music. Mm-hmm. And going back and referencing. So it's like it's me having the song playing, like, but I'm preparing to do something with the same with the same song. So you're moving it to the right moving to, it to reallocate the right. Q one or what? Yeah. Or or to fix something. So with that it was like I went um doubled it up and then went back to the bitch, made a Q point. So or made two, I made one on the uh oh fuck and then made one on the bitch. So like now I can so whenever I want to of like when everybody's getting hyped and I know the energy's starting to die down because it's like the last hook I can go straight over here like uh oh fuck shit bitch he's bringing back the the high part of it and then then you can there's another button where you can loop it into four bars a mm, bar or okay. two bar so I now I hit it on the same time bitch bitch so now I just got a loop loop and we got four bars ticking together yeah. and you're left to right yeah. and it's like yeah so but this this is basically that was mo bamba over there this is mo bamba is the same thing but i just have it looped now mm. so now it's on so now it's over here it's going to bitch bitch now i can pull that wild boy and then i know that i was like 75 bpm or like 150 mo bamba is like 73 so i'm like okay speed up a little bit make a match and then and bring in wild boy bitch while this is going, bitch, 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 doom, yeah, bitch, yeah, bitch, yeah, bitch. That's crazy. Bitch. So it's it's so it's sort of like, and that's what it's like when you're doing wordplay. So you're doing, um, you're bringing, you're like matching two things based off of like a word, like something might have been sampling off a word or something, or you're just going from one song to the next and just sort of like joining them by maybe a word or phrase that's been yeah said and in the other one and that's something that is done a lot of times in battles and other things but then that's sort of the things where you throw people for a loop and left and like oh and, and what's it like um when you walk away do you remember those moments from your show or do you have a hard time recalling you know lightning in a bottle when something special happens like when i first did i did i had a hard time recalling so i would basically put them in like notes and i have like tons of notes like on my phone of just like different like oh, ideas shit. yeah <laughs> so it's like so that like okay i might have done something and it worked and i'm like okay i'm gonna put that in my phone to go to this this so that i remember that so i don't forget it and i'm like dang what did i do with this song last time if i want to do it again yeah so now i know i'm like okay i have these shirts but i'm like i have so many tons of besides the ones i've thrown out now and that, and that just go, but not even just the doing all traces, just DJing. I mean, just um, blending different things. So it's not as long as it's not like I'm just four hours up here just throwing tricks at people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like I have my my regular programming, mm-hmm. then I have moments of spice. So what's it like when? Um, I had two questions that I wanted to ask. So you have four cues on Serato, right? Um. How many do Eight. you use? Eight? Jesus. Yeah, so you have four at the top, four at the bottom, depending on your mixer. Some mixers have four, but um, the Pioneer ones, and basically all the battle mixers have like eight on one side, eight on another. Interesting. So, so you can queue up eight songs or 
eight no, Q points. Eight Q points on the song. Okay. How many songs can you have lined up with their Q points auto assigned? Depending on the mixer, you can have four, or I think you can have more. Depending on the mixer, too. Okay. So and what's people, practical for your use? Like, what do you really want? I with? do, too. So what people used to do with, like, the big pioneers um, and then, like, the CDJs, some people used to do like four, mm-hmm. like, and, and still some people do, but me personally, I'm like, I am like, I'm not on that. I'm like, I'm not trying to think that much of like having this song and this song and this, no, two, right? Back and forth, back and forth. So you can say, you can have four and I think maybe you can, I, I think there might be a, something where you can have more, but. Mm. I'm not at that level yet. When I, it's also like it seems it seems practical to be playing with two. You know, my left to right fade kind of anticipates what I'm mm-hmm. doing. But I'd be interested in just seeing how some guys uh, delegate tasks to be in front of their set. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Where it's like, okay, I'm anticipating this coming down the pipeline. I want to have it on the left side. So maybe that's one and three, and this is two and four. Yeah. And it's like things just kind of drop into place. <clears throat> but it doesn't seem like. There's that much premeditation in the set. It seems very with me being open format. There's not that much premeditation. So like, there's different. It's different strokes for different folks. Some people, I've heard of like them presetting almost their entire set and going out and playing. Mm. Me, I don't do that. So like, I have like all my different crates of where I can go, and a lot of times I'll like go out or I might be there a little bit early. Read the crowd as far as like seeing what they like. Get up there, play a song, and go, and not have any um, not have any really like, just go and sort of like let the night take me. I won't have any like direction on, like what's gonna be my next song. I might have like I might get a feeling like okay, I know I'm gonna do two, three, like two, three, four songs ahead, but it's not like I'm gonna. Probably playing my night from like, oh, it's 10 to 11. I'm doing this 11 to 12. Yeah, you ain't dropping a set list down saying like, here I go. Yeah. I mean, I can do those for certain different like types of events where it needs to be. Say if it's like a wedding, I need to play these types of songs. Or something. Yeah. Someone gives you a set list yeah. and says like, I want these. It's like, or okay, I'm now I have to artist. predetermine. Yeah, I, ha- I have to do that. But as far as like when I'm playing an open format night, I really like to keep it really open like that because – a big part of being open for my DJ or being a DJ in general is reading your crowd. Mm-hmm. I can't get up there and say, I have this pre-made set and I'm playing a lot of hip hop. And then I notice that the crowd comes in and they really want pop. They really don't mess with hip hop. Or I come in and it's a house set or it might be a house night or something. Or I'm trying to do more housey EDM is. And I come in and it's like, Oh no, they want they want the hits. They want the the bangers. Mm-hmm. This actually happened one time when I was playing Below Zero. I was like, it was supposed to be house, and then they want. But for we were playing house, and at the middle, of the day, they said they want. Oh, they want. They said they want ass shaking music. Okay, so I'm like, <laughs> is house not ass shaking music? I mean, you can be, yeah, but they they want it. They want it. So they wanted something completely different. It's just knowing to how that is knowing. Okay, it's time to adjust. It's time you had. If you really get into that, where like I'm only playing this, you're locked in, and you can't adjust. It can be great for like certain nights. Of like if it's a house night, like you can tell people, take it or leave it. This is what we're playing tonight. But yeah. if I'm being a, an open format DJ where I'm playing everything, and I'm just playing the playing to the crowd. Then I have to have that wicker room where I can adjust. I can pivot from this. I can play. Okay, they didn't like this song. I can pivot to this, or I can pivot to this moment, or like, oh, I think that. Excuse me. <laughs> There's so many times though. I feel like where someone comes up and says, "Play something I can dance to," and I'm looking at you like, "Well, you, can, you can't fucking that. dance." I hate that. It's, yeah, it's, That's it's so vague. Yeah, you have you have no idea. What's going to get you to do that? Because mm-hmm. you're coming up to me because you're being insecure that you can't dance to this. And yes. It's like I am not the problem here, and like, it, 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 that, or you're playing something <laughs> that you don't particularly care for, but I'm supposed to know what you. I'm supposed to know you and know what you like. 
to say play something I can dance to. Uh, well, other people are dancing. I don't know what you like. I mean, I'm. Are you saying you, if I play juvenile back that ass up? Are you? <laughs> I can play some. I, or are you gonna the simple are, hits? Are you gonna, yeah. Are you gonna dance to Katy Perry? Are you gonna dance to Taylor Swift? Yeah. Are you gonna dance to Taylor Swift's new album? Because when I was playing that, some people were dancing. Some people were looking like confused. And I'm like, there's no way you can be confused because how much she sold. Yeah. When it what a it, it's been odd to see people fight over that because like we're talking about um, the the strongest fan base of any artist in the world right now. Uh, coming to bat with the music industry, she's one of the first people to go totally indie at this kind of level, and still have an album that like, take it or leave it. You don't have to love her new shit. Like, mm-hmm. I wasn't floored by the new album, but I haven't listened to it enough to love it. Uh, and that kind of leads me into a question I wanted to ask you: like, how much do you have to study up on the game, on top forty, on the top, on the Billboard, to stay current in what you do? Tons. So you really have to stay on top of it um, because as far as like you want to see what you want to stay on top of like what's coming down the pipeline. You want to know like if you have these songs that you might download from the new Taylor album, or are they going to hit like one indicator? I'm like, how much are they getting played? How many streams are this? Is this, is this a big song that's being streamed? And also, the, and there's so many other factors that go into it. What, where are you at as far as like what kind of venue are you playing? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're in a city that's really sort of new, like big and new, uh, I mean, big on like being sort of like the first and up on new things, yeah. then new things can sort of get dro- um, dropped and they're more receptive to it versus sometimes you can play in venues and you could play a song that, has tons of streams but then people are looking confused it's like oh don't worry you'll get in two months because it might be popping as far as streams it might be popping in some spaces but it might not be popping for the club yet Mm -hmm. so it's like you want to have like as far as like an arsenal of things that potentially be your next bangers but then also you want to be able to work them in and out and test and see how they work for you in different situations. So you don't want to just be like dated. Whereas like somebody comes and requests some things and you're like, I don't have all this. And you're like feeling like you're behind. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's so interesting. Cause like, cause DJs are a lot of the, uh, the curators of our generation. It's like, no one turns on the radio and listens to shit they don't want to listen to anymore. They get on their phone and they choose what they want to listen to. But when you go to the club and that guy's in the booth, he's going to choose what you listen to. So these people are going to curate of the old and the new what is great for right now. What is your weekend anthem? And not only does it take a lot of information, but like it takes some healthy stereotyping of an audience to look out and say, like, I think I have an idea of who you are right now. And that may not be right and like learning how to pivot comfortably to give them some tension and some release is a really heavy undertaking, man. It is. It's sort of like an uncomfortable stereotype because I can look up into a crowd while I'm setting up and be like, white male, twenties. Cock well, rock. Yeah. Mr. Brightside, four hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But then he I could also look how he dresses and like, no, he's actually gonna want Young Thug and Gunner. And I'm like, and he's going to request it. And you're going to be like, oh, okay. Yeah. But then you can see a, you can see an older female. Looks like she's newly divorced. <laughs> and she she how, wants to hear. She how wants are you to, picking that up? Oh, no, hold on. How are you picking up nearly divorced? Because she's she out. She's got a tan line of a former wedding ring. She's, or got the, she's, she's got the tan line of the former wedding ring. And she's out She's oh. out living her best life. She's oh out. God. She's out like she's 25. Like she's, she's scandalous. And she wants she wants to hear the hits that were popping in the club when. When before, she was on the prowl initially. Exactly. Yeah. Initially on our first run. She's like, oh, I so want to hear old school hip hop. I want to hear Juvenile back then. <laughs> I want to hear Nelly. Is that it's really such here. a classic? Back then, as- okay. It's I, I would notice I that it's new. I would notice that for the newer generation, it is starting to fade. That used to be like a certified like ease. That used to be like 
like a layup as far as like you're at the top of the night, you just drop that, and oh, they're gonna want to shake it. Yeah. Now I know it's a newer generation. It's starting to wane a little bit, which is sort of like disheartening. But I mean, it, it it's hard because like now it means like okay, there's a shift coming that you mm-hmm. have to preemptively get in front of. Yeah. And it's also crazy like. I see buddies of mine that are really in the cover game. I'm like, you know, I respect guys who play covers on an acoustic guitar. It's a difficult lifestyle. But they learn songs when they were in brand new hits Mm -hmm. that 20 years later are the hits they showed their children. And now these kids are growing up and they love 80s hair metal. You know, like there's things that are classic to them. So maybe back that ass up is in a 10 year. You it's, know, it's like, sort of like sabbatical, a, and it yeah, comes it's sort back. of like that cyclical thing uh, where everything comes around in 20 years. So it's not to say that it isn't a banger, but it's, it's not also, pop culture, though. Yeah, so it's like, it's one that's like, oh, yeah, we know it, but they might be in a exactly that low period where these kids are growing up with like 99, 2000. 99, 2000 was when they were born. So mm-hmm. by the time they were like five and six and seven, their parents might have been listening to oh five oh six hip hop. Mm-hmm. You, that's also where you have to think of, like, look at different demographics and stuff. Like, okay, if there's young. Okay, they might be in the two thousands and ninety nine, like that that age bracket where it's like, okay, if they grew up and their parents were playing stuff, they might have been playing lollipop. Uh, Lil Wayne and other things like that. That's one reason why I like my 2000s and odd sets still go off so heavy because like the the younger kids, they're like, oh, they remember when they were kids and their parents Eighth were Eighth grade playing. mixtures and exactly. shit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then also for our generation, we're like, oh, yeah, I remember this when I was in the high school. And then the other, um, and then even the older people are like, oh, I remember this it used to be a banger in college. So that, that whole thing, that is like, you get you get from like 2000 like mid 2000s to almost mid 2010s yeah do you, you keep that information on serato do you read years as you consider parts of your set or do you know years in relation to artists so a lot of times i put them in crates okay. so like you have different crates and this is for like with old old school DJs, you used to have to carry the vinyl. Yeah, you're calling you call in the milk crate, yeah. but this is a folder on but a This is uh, a folder. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> like, I have them in different folders and I have, and this is where I, like, I label things. So, like, I'll label one, like, aughts, like, to the, so yeah. that's my 2000s and stuff. And so, these are the hits I know that are hits in 2000s. And then I'll have my, like, my throwback pop hits, and these might be throwback pop hits from, like, 2000 to two, to even 2015. But I know that these bank, these were top 40 bangers. Mm. The odds might be more hip hop top, um, hip hop bangers from the from the golden or from the older ages, and yeah. just have and have like the label of different things. I'm like, oh, I know how I want to go. I can pull it from here, mm-hmm. and then I have and even sometimes I'll have stuff labeled by year, like 2020, 2019, 20. So like I'll know that like okay if I pull this on this is from 2018, and I know that if it was a banger or not, how much I played it and how much I kept it in certain types of folders. Does it tell you how much you've played a certain song? Yeah, so Serato now Ooh, has a thing that's where so cool. How many times you played it? So I have songs in there. Where I'm like, oh, I already know I played it, but then sometimes I'm like, dang, I played this song a lot. <laughs> that that's crazy. What what would you say is the the golden age? of like music body for your set right now where are you pulling from the most from where i'm playing at um right now late 90s to it's it's almost like a 12 year period so i would say like late 90s hip-hop to well late 90s hip-hop like bangers like like no diggity like no diggity like snoo nothing but uh yeah like, and I, I feel like not a lot of Snoop stuff even made it. It's yeah. like it's like the major majors. Gin Return, and of Juice the, Return and... of the Mac is a universal starter. Like I can play that anytime, and then people are gonna love it. So here's um, a question for you that's kind of unrelated to that: Is the Chronic a sample based album, or is the Chronic a drum machine based album? Because I can't remember. So they the have a lot of samples in that, but then he has a lot. Of, I think uh, interp- um, interpolations. Okay. So I think a lot of times he takes a lot of different things and sort of like. Tweets him onto his own 
types of thing, but it, it it does. I think I remember the liners. It does have a lot of samples from, especially from G Funk. So it, it does have a lot of yeah sam- samples. But he sort of like builds on to a lot of different ones. So it's like you can hear it's like okay, yeah, that's Parliament, but then he added some other things into it. So it mm-hmm. sort of sounds a little different. Yeah. I, I, I'm wondering right now, and like I've never really had this thought before, but like also to answer your question is, um, so it's that late. It's like '98 to like 2013, 14, or is almost a good sweet spot. Like those mid 2000s, like those those really ring off, but then. When I get into my new stuff, it's, it's, it's still good. But then it's like those those little throwbacks from like a decade ago and stuff. Those really do. Yeah. Those, those are good. But there's also like a null period of like if this was a banger last year and you play it this year, like I'm not that interested. But mm-hmm. six years from now. It might be. It, yeah. Now it's in the catalog. Yeah, if, certified. It, yeah. It goes from like <laughs> it's hot to it's old to it's crass. When you get that old period, it's just like people are just like, eh. if I play Roddy Rich the box, people are just like. Uh, that, if I could play, um, but then also, yeah, you can go to a couple of years, uh, like a even farther back. If I can play Chance the Rapper, no problems. That's that rings off. Yeah, there's something about that album, man. I think there's there's a lot of kids taking acid to that like three years ago. Where it's like that's that's permanent in their lives. I had a nice well, little run, like yeah, that not, was a yeah, not it only was a nice run, rap, but, and it was yeah, I and mean, he was different, man. Like you yeah. know. To to watch Ten Day go ass rap go coloring book mm-hmm. like we found him more uh, commercially satisfying yeah. for kids far outside of Chicago that this shit has no relation to but just great it's like you've never heard uh, a gospel twist on on a new wave rap artist like that it was almost like a it was almost like a second coming of Kanye in a way. Because you sort of had that different side of Chicago where it isn't so gloomy and mm-hmm. super gangs and drillish. So it's but you had it's sort of like more eclectic. Yeah. But then it's that Midwestern, and then also he incorporates kind of he incorporates some of the gospel. But he incorporates some of that gospel. So it's just like it. It sort of had that that uplifting feel. It a mm-hmm. soulful uplifting feel. Where it just made you feel good. Like. Like this is I'm like listen to this and like I, I'm like I'm gonna feel good. This is this, yeah. This but something like day. something like same drugs mm-hmm. is is such a a crazy way of putting into perspective. Like we aren't the same people anymore. Mm-hmm. Like and I think everyone felt that in a different way. But we all like the edginess of of that. Like even if you're not even if you're not in that category, of someone who parties the way that Chance would. Yeah. You you can relate to that, and I think it hit us all in a very different way. Yeah. But like. You bring up Kanye. That's that's a big aha moment for for me because like, I I know that Chance took tons from from Yeezy, but like, I never listened to College Dropout before this year. And the first time I got through the wire, I played it six times in a row. My head was on fire, and I listened to these like interviews where Pharrell was like, not only did I know that was going to be the number one song of the year. I knew that everything after that would be based around that criterion. It's like, wow. It just really shifted. It literally turned. Being a kid and seeing it, it turned hip hop on its head because it really. I think that's when I said, I might have talked to you before, but it just really like flipped hip hop on its head and it flipped the standards of like. It really expanded sort of like the base because hip hop was in a spot where it's like, okay, this is sort of like the gangster rap. Then you had the mafia. So, so it was like it had you had this lane. And if you didn't fit in it, you were sort of almost underground or outside. Like you weren't going to get that mainstream. And then once he sort of released it and it's sort of like this is the everyman. This is the – it sort of killed all the stereo, the gangster mm-hmm. stereo. I'm like, no, this is 90% of the black population is like Kanye. You have the ten percent who does the gangster rap, like, and it sort of like expanded it, so it sort of gave people, it, it created a whole new lane for people to try different things and hold and for, 
it gave people a lane who, if you didn't fit in that sort of gangster rap mold or a gangster rap lifestyle, you didn't have to fake the funk about it. You could be yourself, mm -hmm. and it could, and you could make it work. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to be like, oh, if I'm just a normal kid from, I don't know. Nantucket or something. Or <laughs> I don't know. That, that's a city that Kanye would use because it's a great word. Nantucket. Tuck it, and it rhymes with every. It, well, yeah, everything yeah, you, you want to. You can rhyme with some, but yeah, if you were just from a, a kid from just a regular, if you're just a normal person, you didn't have a super traumatic upbringing or, or a super underdog like a poverty story or something like that. You didn't have to fit in this stereotype that to make it in hip hop like you could love hip hop and have a different perspective of it and be successful and it's just like that that album really did like change i remember on that album never let me down with um jay z i remember i listened to that after my uncle died and i cried like a baby <laughs> cuz it was just like it was so moving i was just yeah. like cried and i was like young so i was like 7th 8th grade and i was like that's a tough that, that it was tough but it all, and i was also i cried cuz it was like it was a hard time cuz i was close to uncle and then it was so beautiful a song i was like this, this i was like this sonically i was like oh my god i've never heard anything yeah. like it it's so, it's so crazy when a song relates your feelings to the music that you need like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a powerful way to to wrap this up. It's just like when someone feeds you the soundtrack of your life, uh y you can be complete. You can be you can be so comfortable in in suffering and pain mm -hmm. when someone reaches out sonically and gives you that gift. Yeah. It, I mean, there's so many times where people say music saved my life and uh, Testament, like there's times when I was like after my mom died, like DJing got me through. I say music saved my life, like, and there's uh, there's something about like this sonic landscape that it really just hits your ears and moves your soul, and it's like you can find a song to really like where you can be going through things and you don't understand things, but like how things are going with life, but you can find something that's sort of like talks to you and relates to you and say, and it sort of like reaches out and says, Hey, I know how you are feeling. Cause sometimes you can be in a, a spot where you're in a dark place and you really feel like no one knows how you're going through. But then it's like that song, just like, Hey, I know you feel like there's nobody in your corner and nobody knows how you feel, but this song, you, it hits you. It's like, it speaks to me. I know, that I'm not the only person going through this and it could just be like that little ray of light mm -hmm. in the darkness. So music, I mean, it's a, it's a blessing. It truly is, man. Well, tell them where to find you real quick across all the platforms where you popping the most. You can find me, um, on everything at DJ Ace Deuce, DJ A C E D E U C E. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever. TikTok, dude. These TikToks of you, are you are you slyly filming these people, or are you uh, are you making them feel like you're having such a good time watching them that they're killing it? Because I see some of these people fall, bro. I I was dying on the shitter watching these people on your TikTok today. I, I, I sat mean, on the toilet for an extra thirty minutes laughing it, at people. It's, it's a met I mean, I'm not just like being a creep with it, but <laughs> it's like I'm letting it play out and seeing. And I'm like, okay, because a lot of times people, are, other people are having their phones. Out. I'm like, bro, yeah, I'm gonna get this footage. So follow me on TikTok. Also, a DJ Ace dudes. There's Dude, the a SpongeBob lot. music leading yeah. up to it's so fun. It's, it's so well done. I got well a little done. series on there. Is the things that I see when I'm DJing and the things that I see when I'm DJing. Um, it, I mean, it's it, brutal. Dog. It, it, it is very so brutal. funny. It's it so is, funny. It, it's some things that you will make you question everything. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Cincinnati open format DJ of the year, DJ Ace Deuce. The man, DJ Ace Deuce. Make sure you check him out on all the platforms for all the good things. Uh, without further ado, here comes the truth. I'm going to be at... Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. 
Anderson Tap House this Wednesday for Thanksgiving Eve. We have the Butter Boys Pre Turkey Butter Bowl. Okay, the original Butter Boys are gonna be playing for your sweetness uh, from nine to one ish. Uh, myself, Nick Hack, Sammy Ruscher. Don't miss it. This is gonna be uh, not the last time we play with this trio, but it's the first time in a while. It's gonna be hot. Uh, Friday night, we're going to be at New Jeff Ruby's downtown. That show starts at 8 p.m. featuring the whole damn recipe. Myself, Johnny Disco, Nick Hack, Chris Keith, Jason Branscombe, uh, and one other surprise member to be announced. Uh, this Sunday, every single Sunday night, 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. at Fish Bowl at the Banks, a place to be. Come see me, players. Uh, Friday, December 2nd, I'm going to be at Lobby's Grill in Canton, Ohio with Miss Chandler Carter, one of my best friends. It's going to be a phenomenal show. I need to double check our start time, but it'll be fantastic. Catch us on the road. Uh, December 4th, everything, every single Sunday night, find me at Fishball the Banks. Uh, I'm going to Del Rey, Florida to play a new tin roof down there and to see one of my childhood best friends, Corey. So, uh, I'm going to be down at the Del Rey tin roof on December 7th. December 8th and December 9th. Uh, show times vary. Check it out on my website. More details to come. And then that Sunday, I'm back at the fishbowl. That is it, everybody, for the wave. Come see me at the shows. Take care of yourself in the meantime. I love you. Peace. <laughs>